Okay, now let's turn to the United States. We did something like it. Mr. Tsipras likes to say that Syriza is just doing what FDR did. So I want to begin by again reminding you about a little history. This time it's our history, FDR. It's 1933. We've got a collapse of capitalism, worse even than the one we've had since 2008. It's really bad. 25% of our people are unemployed. Poverty is everywhere. You know, many of you read, I don't know, uh, John Steinbeck, Grapes of Wrath, Mice or Men, remember those descriptions? Uh, a lot of people were like that. A lot of people waited for the coal car to come by on the freight train because little bits of coal would fall off and the children would go and get them because they're the only way you keep warm, etc., 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 etc. Much good American literature was produced out of that misery. But something interesting happened. Again, Greece is an interesting example. The American people reacted to that misery, the collapse from the roaring 20s into the miserable 30s, by getting angry at rich people and at corporations, big time. Starting in 1933, millions of Americans who had never been in a union, who came from families where no one had ever been in a union, Joined unions was the greatest organizing drive in American history. Unions have never achieved that before, and they've never achieved anything like it since. In a matter of two or three years, millions of Americans joined a union to save them from the horrors of the Depression. Working together with the unions, organizing, were two socialist parties, not just one, two. A kind of reformist, middle-of-the-road one, and a, what we now call Trotskyite one. The Socialist Party and the Socialist Workers Party, for those of you who know your history. And also working with them was the American Communist Party. Big, powerful organizations, all of them. And the combination, wow, the Communists, the Socialists, and the CIO, it was called, the Movement to Organize Workers, that's where the AFL-CIO comes from, the CIO part. And they mobilized millions of Americans. And they went and talked with Roosevelt, and they had a conversation. Frank, they said, <laughs> we here represent millions and millions of people. Uh, we like you. You're a Democrat. And compared to Republicans, we probably like any Democrat. But nonetheless, we like you. We like you. And uh, we want to support you. But you've got to do something about the mass suffering of the American people. And we've got to tell you in all honesty that if you don't, we've got a lot of people who want to do here what those Russians did over in the Soviet Union. And this is 1933. The, the Soviet Revolution is a memory. It wasn't that long before that. And Roosevelt was a very smart politician. He knew they were not bluffing. They represented millions of people. They had mobile. They had done something that nobody expected them to do, organize all these industries. Go back if you have a chance to go to a library and look at the, the cities across America that were scenes of worker demonstrations every day. Minneapolis and Philadelphia and Chicago and New York and Trenton and on and on and on. This was scary time for business. So Roosevelt listened and he said, OK, I'm going to make you a deal. I'm going to go talk to the rich and the corporate leaders. Roosevelt knew them since he had gone to school with them, intermarried with them, and all the rest. So these were friends of his. And I'll see what I can do. And he met with the businesses. And he said to the businesses, basically, uh, I've got to take care of all these poor people. Uh, and I advise you to help me, because the only way I can take care of them is if you give me the money. Because it's a depression. We don't have any money. Nobody's paying taxes. Everybody's unemployed. All the businesses are shut down. The government has no money, like today. So we have no money. The only way I can take care of the people is if you give me the money. And I advise you to do it. Because if you don't, those people are going to make sure you don't have any money to give me. <laughs> it's going to be over. Half of them were not convinced at all. That's the forerunner of what we call today the Koch brothers. No, no, seriously, that's where that comes from. 
The other half agreed with Roosevelt. They were scared. With half of the business community and the rich in his pocket, he went back to the coalition of the CIO, the socialist, and the communist, and he said, okay, I got a deal. We can, we can do business. I am going to get money from the rich and the corporations, and I'm going to help you. I'm going to do it. But you've got to promise me something. Stop talking about revolution. Put that away. If you keep doing that, I can't make a deal. I can't get the rich and the... That's the deal. And they all agreed. The CIO bought it, the socialists bought it, and the communists bought it. They said they didn't, and not all of them agreed, but they bought it. And what did Roosevelt do? Now you can see why Mr. Tsipras and Syriza is paying attention. 1933, let's go real fast. Roosevelt gets up and says, I'm going to create social security. What? In the middle of a depression when there's no money, you're about to tell everybody who's over 65, here, here's a check every month for the rest of your life. Yup, that's what he did. And before he, people could even deal with the enormity, we had no social security before that, he announced the unemployment compensation system. We had never had a program of giving money to people who are out of work for a year or two every week. The government had no money, it was the Great Depression. He said, I'm going to give the old people who are over 65 a check every month and the unemployed, of whom there were millions, a check every week. I'm going to raise the minimum wage, which he did. In fact, he established the minimum wage. We didn't have one before that. I'm going to make a minimum wage, and he made it nice and high. In real terms, higher than it is now. But then came the big one, as if these weren't big enough. I said the president, went on the radio, I am going to tell you, the American people, the following. If the private sector, he didn't use the word capitalist, that word sticks in Americans' throats. They can't <laughs> quite get it out, which is why I say it so often. So, if the private sector can't provide work to the millions of Americans who ask only to have a job, then of course, as if it were self-evident, I, as president, have to do that. And between 1934 and 1941, he created and filled 15 million jobs in the United States, which the government paid for. They paid the salaries. Some of you visit the national parks. Many of those were built by those people, and so on. And where did he get the money? Because this is the best part. <laughs> he taxed corporations and the rich. I got to say it again. In an American audience, most of you will pretend you didn't hear what I said. <laughs> he taxed corporations and the rich. A lot. That's where the money came from. Because that's where the money always is to solve these social problems. You know it, I know it, and unfortunately, they know it. But he did. Let me give you just a couple of examples. The top income tax bracket that Roosevelt was in favor of. Well, let's deal with the the top he ever asked for. State of the Union message, 1944. We're in a war. In a war. He sends a message, Roosevelt president, to the Congress. I propose that the top bracket, the top income tax rate on the richest people be, ready? 100%. <laughs> See, you're laughing because you don't know your own history. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Every dollar over 25,000 a year, that was the cutoff then, that would be about 380, 390,000 a year now. Every dollar over 25,000 you get, and you don't get. <laughs> we get it. 100%. We take every dollar. The president proposed a maximum income. That's what that means. The maximum income you get is 25. And if you get more than that, you ain't getting it. He sent the message. The Republicans, doing what the Republicans are supposed to, went ballistic. 
yelling, screaming, and, 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 until a compromise was reached between the Republicans and the Democrats, which they then sent to the president who signed it, making the top bracket in 1944 94 percent. Every dollar over 25 you got, you got to keep six cents. And the other 94 cents went to the government of the United Nobody States. Knows. Now, I studied economics in college, uh, and what my textbook said would happen if you were to lose, let's say, four million manufacturing jobs. Who here studied economics? Someone did. So what did your textbook say would happen? Retrain, reskill, higher productivity work, economy grows all as well, right? You remember that from macroeconomics that you got to be in? And then, yeah, that's fine. Um, I got an A. Um, so, so, um, so that is what the macroeconomics textbook says. And then uh, it turns out in real life, uh, when you go look at the numbers of what happened to manufacturing workers in Michigan or, or Indiana, uh, 40 to 44 percent of them left the workforce and were never heard from again. Now, how do they survive? About half of that group filed for disability. Uh, there are now more Americans on disability than work in construction. 20 percent of working age adults in some parts of the country. And if you go to these communities, you can see it. There are just a lot of people on disability. Now, are they genuinely disabled? Yeah, a lot of them had genuine injuries because if you're working in a manufacturing plant for you know 12 years, like you probably have something messed up. Um, but in, like, would they prefer to be working? Like, in most cases, yeah. Um, and so what happened to the manufacturing workers is almost certain to happen to the truckers. You know, it's like, there is going to be no magical realignment. You're not going to take 500,000 middle-aged men and turn them into coders or whatever ridiculous fantasy <laughs> someone is peddling. Um, and and, and th the other aspect of it, too, is that it's like, why on earth do you think you're supposed to try and turn a truck driver into a software engineer? Like, reflect on that for a moment. And the reason is that we define ourselves by economic value at this point. It's like if you don't have any economic value, then we have to turn you into something that does, even if it makes no sense in the world to think that we can do it. Uh, so I'm meeting with various legislators in DC being like, guys, what are we gonna do? We're in the third inning of the greatest economic and technological transformation in the history of the country. What is the plan? And what do you think they said to me when I said, what is the plan? <laughs> There's no plan. <laughs> they looked at me like I had a, I was speaking another language. The responses I got were, we can't talk about that. We should study that. And we must educate and retrain Americans for the jobs of the future. And then I said, guys, I looked at the studies. Do you all want to guess how effective government-funded retraining programs are? Yes, zero to 15%. Uh, we're terrible at it. And so then when I said, we're terrible at that, then the legislator would be like, well, I guess we're going to get better at it then. And then they'd just go back to their lunch. And I'd just be like, holy shit. Like, is this what passes for thinking, uh, you know, like at, at this point? Are we so far gone as a country that we're not even reckoning with the fundamental changes that are devastating our communities? Yeah, yeah, that's where we are. That's totally where we are. So then I go home. I'm steeped in this knowledge, this certainty, this dread. And keep in mind, I'm one of the most celebrated social entrepreneurs of this generation. I get medals, awards, accolades, like for being the guy who created thousands of jobs around the country. And I am 100% certain that my work, as proud as I am of it, was pouring water into a bathtub that has a giant hole ripped in the bottom. And no one's going to do a damn thing about the giant hole. So then I went home and was like, OK, like what is the plan? What are we going to do? And I have two young kids who are six and three. And uh, so literally, like I'm looking at them being like, am I really just going to raise them in this country that's going to disintegrate around them and just like start trying to sock money away so that we can like have a bunker like some of my richer friends? Like, is that really the plan? And that struck me as deeply uh, pathetic as a plan. And so I said, OK, what is the actual plan? Like, what am I going to do? And then I thought, well, in order to make it so that the people that Polly uh, is worried about, like, that the people will do better. You have to actually redesign our economy. You have to, like, change the rules so that we don't value ourselves solely as economic inputs, but we value ourselves intrinsically. Like, maybe we're worth something even if our truck starts driving itself. Or the AI is better than us at reading the radiology film. Or, you know, my mall closes, and, like, I'm a, you know, 39-year-old woman who works in the mall. 
So we have to start looking at valuing ourselves at some other mechanism than the marketplace, because the marketplace is about to turn on us in epic, catastrophic fashion. And so I was like, okay, how do you make that happen? And so then I looked and said, well, the only way to rewrite the rules of the economy is to get control of the government. And I said, okay, how do you get control of the government? You run for president and win. And then I said, okay, what are the rules for running for president? Only two rules, it turns out. Uh, 35 or older and natural born citizen. So I was like, check and check. And, and, then, I, and then I was like, and then check number three is I went to my wife, I was like, hey baby, I think I'm gonna run for president. <laughs> And she was like, <laughs> she was like, that's nice, like, you know, pass the sauce. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that's how I came to run for president on a platform of universal basic income, which is that we have to start putting $1,000 a month in the hands of American adults as soon as possible, which would enable tens of millions of people to make effective transitions. And as a parent, what excited me the most about this was that the data very clearly shows it makes children healthier and stronger, it improves nutrition, it improves graduation rates, it improves mental health, it improves relationships, domestic violence goes down, hospital visits go down. It actually just makes life better for people. If you're interested in female empowerment, there are millions of American women who right now are in exploited or abusive jobs or relationships or are doing work that is unrecognized by the market uh, like my wife. My wife is at home with our two boys, one of whom is autistic, and what does the market value her work at? Zero, unfortunately. You know, she gets the big uh, goose egg. Uh, GDP, the same thing. When I know she's working much harder and doing more important work than uh, certainly like I, you know, like um, the average hedge fund analyst or whatever it is. Um, and so we, we have all of these perversions baked into our valuation of ourselves based upon what the market says is important or valuable. And so you create this universal basic income, which is not my idea. Uh, Thomas Paine was for it at the founding of the country, he called it the citizen's dividend. Martin Luther King championed it whole, like full on the last year of his life in 1967 before he was killed. Milton Friedman and a thousand economists signed a study saying this would be great for the economy and it passed the House of Representatives twice under Richard Nixon in 1971. It came this close to being law, it's called a family assistance plan, would have guaranteed everyone a minimum income. Uh, and the reason it didn't pass was that Democrats in the Senate wanted a higher income threshold. And then 11 years later, one state passed a dividend where everyone in that state now gets between one and $2,000 a year. And what state is that? And how do they fund it? And what is the oil of the 21st century? Technology, that's right. I've heard marijuana, I've heard a lot of things on that one. <laughs> but it is technology, and now I'm going around the country saying, look, what they're doing in Alaska with oil money, we can do for everyone with technology money. As a matter of fact, we don't have a choice but to start moving this direction, because if we follow GDP and capital efficiency, we're gonna follow it off a cliff, which we are doing right now. We're in the middle of it. Donald Trump is not business as usual. Donald Trump is a sign of disintegration and the disintegration is accelerating. You can see it in any numerical measurement. Life expectancy, mental health, uh, deaths of despair, like any measurement you want, business formation, marriage, child rearing, all of them. Historic lows, multi-decade lows, moving for a new job, multi-decade low. Pretty much any measurement of healthfulness you can find in America is at a multi-decade low or a record low right now. We are falling apart. And so this is a necessary, this is an overdue move. Like this should have happened decades ago but here we are, it's 2019, and we have to make it happen now. So that's universal basic income, put a thousand bucks a month in the hands of every American adult.